I witnessed this incident about two years ago when I was in Domino's with my wife and kids. That incident took my soul out of me and my kids, but there was a twist that shocked us the most. Listen to my story and you will know on your own. The first phase of Corona struck New York City, and most people were getting infected. So the government restricted almost every public place, restaurant, and park. We were kind of living in fear of getting infected every day. I had great responsibilities upon me, and thanks to my luck that my work was completely IT-based, so the lockdown didn't affect my earnings too much. I was working from home and getting my income as usual. The only thing was that we were locked in our apartment for continuous three months. Finally, the first phase came to an end, and everything started to open slowly. The restrictions were also partially lifted, and now we could go outside. After being locked in our apartment, everyone wanted to go out and take some fresh air, but we had to be on alert because the threat was not over yet. It was the first day when the restrictions were lifted, and my family, especially my kids, started to force me to take them out. I was afraid to plan for any trip, but was helpless in front of them. I knew they had also been locked in the same cage for continuous three months, and now they wanted to fly. They were kids, and roaming around and playing was in their nature. But thanks to the lockdown, they missed the whole three months of waiting until the day when the lockdown would be lifted. Now it was the time, and they were begging me to take them out. I tried hard to convince them, but they didn't listen to me even once. Finally, my wife also came in with their support and said to me that she also wanted to go somewhere. I knew that we were in danger of being affected by corona, so I was not ready to take them, but I had no other option. So I agreed, but on the condition that we would only go to some restaurant which was in the nearby area. They were not too happy, but they had no other option, so they agreed. I asked them to decide on the spot while I get fresh. I went to my room and got fresh. When I returned to the hall, my kids were running to me and told me that they had decided on the location. I asked them about it, and they told me that they wanted to go to the Domino's, which was only a few miles away from my home. I agreed to this and asked them to get ready along with their mom. They were very happy and excited, so they changed into new clothes and returned back to me within 10 minutes. As usual, it was my wife who was late, as she took a lot of time getting ready. We waited for her, and after the next 15 minutes, she returned. I knew she made us wait too long, but after watching her, I thought my wait was worth it. She looked so beautiful that I kept on looking at her until my kids pulled my hand and asked me to go. We went to the parking lot, and from there, to the Domino's. I was not too far away, so we reached there in 10 minutes. We went there and grabbed a seat. I took the menu and asked my kids to select what they wanted. They told me their choice, and I ordered them. After ordering, I came back to my seat and waited for my order to be prepared. I was looking here and there when I noticed a girl sitting in another corner who looked stressed and was crying while hiding her face. I was looking at her, and when my wife noticed me, she asked me if something was wrong, and I told her about that girl. My wife was too kind, so she stood us up and went to that girl to ask her if something was wrong with her. She told her that she had a breakup with her boyfriend, and that's why she was sad. My wife calmed her down and made her believe that everything would be alright. After five minutes of chatting with her, she returned to us and explained everything to me. My kids were waiting desperately for their order to arrive, but it was taking too long. I went to the counter and asked them why my order was late. They replied that they were short-staffed and that if it was the first day to open after lockdown, they apologized to me and told me that they would prepare my order soon. I understood their problem because the pandemic had affected everyone equally. I went back to my seat and waited. I was looking at my phone when I heard some commotion. I looked outside and saw two guys running inside the store. They had pistols in their hands and were wearing masks to hide their faces. They came in and looked toward everyone and just after that, they ran to the girl who was sitting in the corner. They went to her and grabbed her hair and threw her on the ground. I wanted to help that girl, but my wife stopped me. She was afraid because they had guns with them, and they could have harmed me or the kids, so I remained sitting there. They started slapping and kicking the girl. She was begging them to leave her, but they were merciless beasts. One of them held her by her neck, and the second one placed the gun on her chest. 
Before anyone could think anything, he pulled the trigger and banged. I couldn't believe my eyes. They actually shot that girl in front of my eyes. I looked toward my kids. They were completely scared and were shaking in their toes. I was also too scared. The girl was bleeding continuously, and they threw her into a corner and ran outside the store. I wanted to help the girl, but I was frozen in my seat and couldn't move my body. My wife shook me and asked me to call the cops. I thought that it would be a good idea and pulled out my phone to call the cops. But suddenly, I heard a voice that asked me to stop and not to call the police. I looked here and there to look for the lady who asked me to stop, and I was shocked to see that the girl who had been shot a moment ago was standing in front of me and asking me not to call the cops. I could clearly see that she was bleeding continuously and her dress was soaked in blood. My wife stood up and held her and asked whether she was okay or not, but she was completely okay and was smiling. I couldn't understand what was going on there. My wife asked her why she stopped them from calling the cops and that was when she told us that what we saw a moment ago was just a play and they were shooting a documentary for their project. I was surprised to hear that and couldn't believe my ears, but then I saw those two guys coming through the gate again, and this time without any mask. They were having a camera inside of a gun this time. They came and hugged the girl. After this, they explained the whole scenario and told us that they were brothers and sisters. Everyone except us in the store knew about this already, but they wanted to capture some real reaction from the audience, so they didn't tell us anything. They apologized to us for our inconvenience and for scaring us, and then left while thanking everyone there. I was in shock even now that what I was really scared of turned out to be a play, and that play almost took my soul out of my body. As a kid, I lived with my grandparents for a while. And let me tell you, my grandfather was not a friendly guy. He was a World War II vet who then enlisted in the Air Force after returning from the Pacific. He didn't even come home to visit his family for several years. The family lore goes that the war had messed him up in the head or that he was injured badly and that he needed time to heal back to himself before coming home. He may have healed but he never returned back to himself. He was always saying things that the end of the world was right around the corner with all the recent wars in the Middle East, the gasoline rationing, Watergate, the Kennedys, etc., etc. He didn't trust anyone, and he was sure that the banks were going to fail, that the Russians were going to invade, that race riots were coming again, his theories changed literally every week. He always warned me that they would be trying to come and get our stuff someday soon, so we had to be ready. We had shelves of food, water generators, fuel, gold bars, buried firearms, and ammo. You know, the usual. I was 9 or 10 at the time. And this would have been around 1972 or 73. We were living in a small cabin on a ridge looking over the Maumee River in northeast Ohio for the summer. This was his weekend getaway primarily. There were very few neighbors for miles, and the ones that were nearby were mostly weekenders. The nearest small town was about 10 miles away, and the hospitals were even further away. If I recall, there was a two-lane highway that's on the opposite side of the cabin with nice views of the river. That was pretty much a straight road with slow curves every 10 miles or so. About half a mile down the road though, there was a crazy sharp curve that terminated and a small bridge over a creek. There were several accidents there every year, and some with fatal injuries. We could often hear the crashes. 
Sometimes, I would wander down there the next morning to look at the scene and stuff and wonder if the drivers were doing okay. One warm summer night, we were awakened by a pounding on the front door. My room was right next to the door, and my grandfather was down the hallway a bit. I remember getting out of bed and having him hand me a shotgun. Well, he held a 1911 as he looked through the window to see who it was. I had never recalled anyone ever stopping by before, especially in the middle of the night. The cabin was elevated with a storm shelter underneath, so there were four steps leading up to the door. And we had one of those yellow old security lights in the yard, and things always look kind of hazy and weird at night because of them. I looked out the window next to him and saw a man and a woman on the lower step of the door. They must have knocked and then stepped back down to appear less threatening. It was a good call, because he opened the door a bit while openly displaying and keeping his pistol pointed at them. The woman exploded in a crying, blabbering, screaming wail all at once. She said that there was a terrible accident that had just happened down at the curve, and can we please call an ambulance? She said that there were other people who were seriously hurt, and they needed help and asked if we would come to help them too. Now, this man hated hippies more than anyone else, and these two might just have qualified. She had on ripped jeans, one of those suede leather fringe jackets, and the guy looked like he had a biker vest on. She did have what looked like blood in her hair and was not making much sense at all. What was really weird was the guy wasn't saying anything. He was just standing off the porch listening to her go off. I assumed that he was intimidated by the 45 pointed at him and didn't want to antagonize the old man with a crew cut holding it. My grandfather was sure that they were stoned and kept telling the girl to calm down, but she wouldn't, and they got into a screaming match between them, ending with him telling her to get the hell off of his property or he would shoot them both. We were both outside, watching them head back to the road, and I noticed the guy wasn't even wearing any shoes. As I didn't hear a crash, and they were so weird, I didn't know what to think. We went back inside, and my grandfather sat me down and explained his theory to me. They were making the story up. They were most likely drug addicts who were looking for some poor suckers to rob or maybe kill. Unfortunately, it was not that crazy of a theory, as, at the time, the Manson family murders had just happened less than four years ago. I recall the Manson story held my grandfather's interest for quite some time. I asked him what about the blood in her hair and he stated that it was fake, trying to gain our trust and entrance into our cabin. I thought we could just call the state police to be safe, but he wasn't fond of inviting cops into his world either. So, we just went back to bed. As soon as I woke up, I was still curious but didn't want to walk down to the bridge on the curb this time. Later in the morning, several police cars and pickups began arriving and parking off to the side of the road down there, and I couldn't resist going down to check it out. My grandmother went with me, as my grandfather was still at work, and an ambulance was departing as we arrived at the location. 
when we soon saw the evidence of an accident the previous evening. There was a smashed guardrail, bits of metal glass, and a tree off the road with a deep gouge, and a bunch of bark missing. A mangled motorcycle was down in the ditch, and several people were searching around in the heavily wooded creek area. We overheard that there was at least one man dead, and his girlfriend was found a half mile down the road in really bad shape, and was in critical condition after being found by a passing motorist. It was a single motorcycle that had lost control as far as I understood. One woman was sobbing to one of the troopers, asking if they had found the boots yet. Turns out, her son was the motorcyclist who'd wrecked, and I guess the impact threw him out of the new boots that she said that he had just purchased. She also said that he didn't ever wear a helmet, and she wished that he would. The cop tried to console her, and told her that he didn't suffer as he was most assuredly killed instantly when he hit the tree. I tell you, I think my heart nearly jumped out of my chest. And I have never felt so cold in my life when I started connecting the dots. We walked back home without giving any of the people there any information. I don't remember even speaking to any of them, but I was in a daze. I was freaked out for days. I didn't want to connect the dots anymore, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Who did that girl want us to help? I heard my grandparents discussing it only once later that night and coming up with a story to help them sleep at night. They decided that the guy wasn't killed in the crash, that he had somehow died later on, most likely from all the drugs that he and his girlfriend were hopped up on, and that the girl was just fine. We never mentioned it again, but we didn't spend as much time there at that vacation area anymore. It was late night, and our movie ended later than we had presumed, and then the only place that was open to get a bite to eat was the weird Burger King at the corner of the street across the cinema. It was very late at night, and everything was closed other than Burger King, and we were all very hungry and didn't really care about the place or how it looked. It was more about, let's eat it, and less about hanging out and we were ordering everything as we were famished. And we ordered and hurried everything and waited as our order was coming in. We weren't ready to leave just yet, so we decided to book an Uber for later, and we sat around waiting for our order while the guy at the Burger King was slowly preparing our order. It was almost closer to the midnight, and we weren't planning anything special, so we decided to just eat and leave. But our order was still on its way, and we were getting impatient and we decided to let the guy know that we want to get in the order as fast as we could, and we told him that we are bumming a smoke outside, so call us in when the order is done. He agreed, and went on to his task to making the burgers and stuff. We looked at him from the outside, and he was working, but he seemed clueless, and since they looked short-staffed, I decided to go in and ask him if he needs help. My friend stopped me and told me to not be so kind. One of my friends said, it is their job to do it, and they are getting paid to do it. Don't you worry about him. He is a big boy and he will handle himself. Just wait until he calls us in. We have paid for it, that's so wait and be professional. I agreed to my friend and waited, but mostly I was looking at the man inside doing his job and struggling with everything in there. So instead of not hearing my friend's advice, I went inside to ask if he needed any help. As I entered, he was startled, and I asked, do you need any help in the kitchen? And he nervously said, No, thank you. You're kind, but I will manage. And he replied, It's all messy here anyway. And I said, I have seen worse. It is okay if you want my help. I can help you. I used to work at McDonald's before this. And he replied, It is okay. We have a company policy anyway. Can't let you back here. Sorry. And I replied, That's alright. I get it. And then he made the conversation. 
That is why I thought I had seen you somewhere. You worked at the McDonald's at 4th. And I said, yes, I did work there last summer. And he replied, oh yeah, I know. I came there a couple of times. And we shared smiles and went back to waiting. And then I asked him, so what did your super say about the time? It's late and you are still open. And he replied, I'm committing like a crime here. I open late so I can make some extra bucks. I get an extra 40 to $50 per night, and in return, really hungry people get served. I guess I can trust you. And I said with a smile, yes, you can trust me. That's pretty cool. People get fed and you get extra money. No harm done. And our conversation was very light and friendly. And the man even got me the coffee for free and some donuts they brought in for the office party. I thanked him. And as he went back to working on our order. Then, a minute later, he said, Your order is almost ready. Why don't you call in your friends while I pack your order? And I went and called the guys. And one of my friends who lectured me previously said, You won't ever listen to anyone. Your kindness will kill us one day. As we went inside, we saw that our order was all packed and ready. And we were about to leave when one of our friends couldn't wait and started eating the burger. And was pissed as it spit it out and started shouting at the man. Hey yo, this is shit. This tastes like burnt coal. Man, you cook shit. I want my money back for real, dog. And then aggressively started heading towards the guy. And as he did all of that, the other friend tasted their burgers and they were all real bad. They were charging the man. And the man pulled out a gun and said, Get out of the place. Get the hell out before I change my mind and shoot you all. Your friend here, he looked at me and continued, is a good man and the very reason I'm going to let you all go. And we just got out of that place as quickly and got away as far as we could without talking to each other. The next morning we saw in the news the same Burger King that we were in and the news headline about how a Burger King employee went on a carnage and killed the whole staff that bullied him during the job. At that time I was talking with him and having conversation. He was cold and had killed everyone. I still cannot seem to get over that chilled, stone-cold, nerve-wrecking experience I had in that Burger King. This incident happened to me about three years ago when I was 17. Back then, we used to live in an apartment which was a sort of mini-city in itself. It had all the facilities we needed, including markets, shopping malls, parks, schools, and many more. My point to tell all this is to make you aware that the campus was very vast. There were three blocks and all of them were away from each other. We lived in the first block. If we talk about my favorite place, so let me tell you that there was a Burger King which was in the first lane of the fourth block. When it comes to burgers, there was no one who could compare me. It was my favorite place as I used to go there daily or three to four times a week. The staff members had also been familiar to me as I was a kind of regular customer. It was a normal day, and even after having my breakfast, I was feeling kind of hungry. But wait that craving was not for homemade food, but I wanted to eat a burger dipped in heavy cheese along with some cold drink or soft drink. Without wasting my time, I hopped out of bed and went out of the room. I searched for my mom who was working in the kitchen, and I told her that I was going to grab a burger. My mom knew about my habit and was always scolding me to focus less on street foods, but I never listened to her. That day was no different. She kept on shouting at me to stop me from going as she was preparing lunch for us, but I ignored her and ran out. I was walking across the lanes when a friend of mine saw me and asked me to wait. I waited for him and told him my point to walk out. Luckily, he was also planning to grab something to eat, so he also came with me to Burger King. We went there and grabbed a seat. He asked me to wait and force he would give the order. I waited for him while he went to the counter and ordered two burgers with cold drinks and little snacks for us. After giving the order details, he returned to the seat and we started chatting about some boys stuff. We were in the middle of our chat when we heard some noises coming from the other seat right in front of us to the corner. We noticed two full frown men were ganged up on a lady and teasing her. They were having some argument which was not clear to us, but it looked like the three of them were familiar with each other. We couldn't understand the matter, but it seemed like they were quarreling over something. We were watching them continuously when the argument between them became serious and they started pushing the lady and beating her. 
Within a flick of seconds, I could just figure out that the lady was screaming and two of them were hitting her with something. I and my friend remained there while looking at the scene. The whole scenario was too horrible and we both were terrified. Soon, they announced in a loud voice and warned all of us in the store to get out as soon as possible. I just gathered the courage of all my life and, no, I didn't go and fight with the murderers. I just ran away with all my might along with my friend. I was a kid back then. I had no clue what to do. Within a minute, the whole store was covered in silence. All the customers along with the staff members ran away from there, leaving that lady with those maniacs. Even while running from there, we could hear the lady screaming in pain, but we were helpless and couldn't help her. But my friend called the cops while running and explained the situation. We reached our home and sat there in a park while thinking about the lady. We were thinking about whether she was alive or not. After a few minutes, everyone started running toward Burger King. We knew this before, so we joined them and asked one of them about the situation. He told me that a lady was killed in the Burger King and the murderers flee from there. We all went there and saw the dead body. Everyone concluded that the lady had been robbed and stabbed to death. That time, I could see her face clearly, and I came to know that the lady was no stranger but my math tutor. The cops also came there after a few minutes and asked us about the scene. We were the prime witnesses, but we were afraid to involve ourselves in this case, so we remained silent and didn't tell them anything. Everyone there told them that they reached there when the murderers already flee. The cops investigated the store and retrieved her body with them. I returned to my home and told my mother about all the things that I experienced. I was afraid and shocked so she asked me to go and rest for a while. I regret to this date why I didn't tell anyone about this. Very much possible that she would have been saved if I had been strong enough to fight them. The scene and her scream are still fresh in my mind. Every night, I ask God to forgive me, because somewhere, I feel I am also responsible for her death. I believe winter is the best time for me. I love winters. It's the cold, dreary mornings for everyone. But for me, those are the pleasant chills that I would trade for any time in any other season. I was born in Alaska and my father was a woodworker. He taught me everything I need to know about Alaska and woodwork. It was definitely one of the greatest things that I inherited from my father. The woodwork craft he taught me, it was remarkable and became the source of my income as I grew up. I started with making tables and then moved my way up to making designer projects that the rich carved for their big houses. And in return, I got paid a good amount of money and it made living in that winter paradise more comfortable than it could have been. I was truly one of the few in there who actually enjoyed winter for what it was. I was like the common likable person in the cold town. Almost everyone knew me there because there was some kind of woodwork that I had done in all those houses. Even in the town, almost everyone knew everyone, so there was this sense of family in there and I was like part of every single family. It wasn't always the case. That town wasn't really someone would live in. The environment was hostile and my father told me that something more sinister than once roamed the town. My father told me this story about how his grandfather and how his grandfather and his friends and family were the first people to populate that town and how much effort it took them to populate the city. It was the story of how they took over the lands. They reached the grounds in the 1800s and it was their boat that stranded them onto those lands. It was not something that they willingly chose to do as they did and they realized that there was more to the land than seems. As the men went out to explore and the women stood by the boat side, the men explored that the land was inhabited by something way more dangerous than humans. It was a predator of some kind, and it was the probable reason that the land wasn't inherited by anyone. This town was far away from any civilization, and with the hard conditions, it was almost impossible to sustain life in such parts. They were hunters and survivors back then, and there was no problem that they couldn't figure out. So they worked and made everything possible for them. 
But this time in this newfound place, there was more to do than just survive, and they did. It was the first night that they saw the creature. It was just a glimpse, but it was big enough to scare them all, and they settled right by the river. One of the men in the tribe drew him, and the recording of what they wrote and what they drew has been kept safe. The creature was by accounts around 8 feet tall, and his body was covered in white hairs, and his footsteps were bigger than usual, and there was this distinct smell about it. It was by accounts a little bit like a yeti, and they were ready to set off sail since the land was almost inhabitable. They decided to leave to find another place to settle in. Then, in the morning, when they woke up ready to move, there were a man down. One of the members of the tribe was hunted by that creature. The signs were all there, and in that moment, they decided to take revenge on that creature and hunt it, and they decided to stop and take revenge. They gathered up and decided to craft a plan where they set up traps through the forest and waited for the creature to get out, but it was stronger, and the only way to tackle it was by going straight ahead in battle with them, and they did. They charged the creature with the spears they made in just one night, and they attacked him, and charged him, and made sure that the creature never hurts anyone again. And then, with everything that happened, they decide to stay there and settle in that cold place, and then make a home out of it. And now 200 years later, this place has become a home, and guess what is the mascot of our place? It's the same creature. Before I knew the story, I always thought it was just a bear. John Hughes was a filmmaker of the mid-80s. If you were a kid back in the 80s, you were living through an entertainment revolution, with MTV making music videos that were failing films, Steven Spielberg on the horizon, Star Wars and Star Treks, and then John Hughes. 80s was the greatest time to be a kid. Televisions were way too important to every household, and with science and technology building everything new every day, you would be always on a lookout to get something. I was specifically stoked about all these advancements. I belonged to a science family. My mother was a mathematician, and my father was an engineer. They were both working with the government, and because of that, we had a really comfortable life. We used to live in the most secure neighborhood in the world. These kids were all smart there, and unlike school, there weren't many problems with the bullying and watching your back for bigger, meaner kids. My parents were getting assigned new projects, and because of that, there was a lot of work involved, and since they were not able to spend much time with me, they would let me have all the cool things as a child. It was their way of compensating about the fact that they couldn't pay much attention. Neither I was complaining about that, nor did they have any regrets. They were practically people, and knew that I would rather have the new Atari than them telling me to study all the time. And then, a month later, my father started staying home. It didn't really feel like he was since he was busy in the garage building something. I had no idea what he was building in there. None of us were really allowed in his working space. He always told me that he had some really dangerous tools in there, and they can hurt me and moreover the people around me, so I never really bothered to get in there. I had everything I needed. In September of the same year, my parents made me sit in the conference hall with them and told me, we will be working with NASA on a classified mission. We will not be at home more than usual, so you will have to take care of yourself. We'll call in a babysitter, but no one is worth mentioning, so your father decided to build you a babysitter. I was clueless about everything they were saying. They might have been the brightest minds in the city, but they definitely not were the brightest when it came to making conversations. They had no training there. And then, as they were awkwardly trying to explain to me, a robot came out on the wheels, and it was a simulated voice like my mother, and the robot said, Hello, Tim. I am going to be your babysitter for the evening. That moment was one of the coolest moments. The science fictions that I was living upon were real, right in front of my eyes. I saw the babysitter, and she was almost human, but she wasn't. My father made her in the garage, and it looked like a high-end robot made in some expensive lab. 
I guess that's why NASA really wanted him on board. They left for the project, and they left me with the robot. He called her Anna, never bothered to call her anything. With them gone away from the project, I thought it was better than I was alone at the house. And there was a sense of freedom that I did not want to get away from. So the right thing to do was to see how good of a babysitter Anna was. It wasn't like I wanted to run away wild. I had no intention of getting out of house, and I wanted to spend that time learning how far I can push Anna. And the first few days were just her chasing me across the house, telling me to do things that I wouldn't do. And I was just pushing through a breaking limit. But there was something that turned in her that changed her, but not according to what I had thought. After a week, her ways were getting much harsher than usual, and she started finding ways to harm me. She would twist my hand, crash into me, and wouldn't let go of me when she got hold. She used to bolt the doors and everything was getting scarier. And a week goes by, she made sure I wouldn't even leave the house. Now I was scared of the deranged behavior she was showing, and I decided to shut her off, but she was not ready for it, and would say in that simulated voice, do not touch me or I will engage. Do not touch me or I will engage. She kept repeating it and I was scared. So I decided not to touch her, but called my father that moment and then he told me what to do. I went into the garage and tried to switch her off, but she hid the switch. It seemed like she was no robot anymore. I was scared she was coming closer and it looked like she would have killed me. So I took the axe that was lying by the side of the garage and whooped across her metallic body and broke her head. But she still wouldn't stop. So I circled around the room, took the water bottle, and poured the water on her. I could see her get all weird. And then I got out as soon as possible. And just seconds after I got out, an explosion destroyed the house. And I was just clueless and scared. My neighbors asked me what happened, and he called 911. I told him, the babysitter tried to kill me, so I killed her instead. The man had no clue what I was talking about, and he got me a soda. Domino's was the first place that I got to work in after getting laid off from my first job. It was one of the easiest places that I worked in, and I found it very easy for me. Now, it wasn't the very high-end job that I had before. But this time, working at Domino's was good for my mental health, and this was something that I really wanted. I was done with the high-end race and competitiveness, and I just wanted to take a break from all of that and just focus on some emotional growth. And this place seemed to be a fit, just right good. And so I stayed at this Domino's, working the shifts, because I did not want to break free from this relaxing work. It might have been tiring physically, but mentally, everything was good. I was getting paid good enough, and being a cashier, I had much more privileges than the guys in the kitchen. And since we had four people working the shifts, the thing was pretty flexible, and I was able to do whatever I want in the free time. And I decided to take up jujitsu lessons. It was something that I always wanted to do, so I decided to take jujitsu and work my way up to a black belt in it. I would do my hours at the dominoes, and then straight away leave for jujitsu. It was pretty great to be able to work up a normal job and then leave to do something that I really loved. It kept my body and my mind both in check. Around a month into the job, I was working night shift. It was the night before Christmas, and I was working the shift for my friend since I didn't really have any plans for the Christmas. Our place opened at 7, so I was there early, waiting for everyone else to come in. And then when they came in, I saw that we were already very short-staffed. We were not planning on opening for the night, but since it was a Domino's and not a family business, we didn't really have any say in the matter. So we started making pizzas, and since it was the only decent pizza place in the city, we were getting the Christmas Eve rush, and people started coming in. And not just that, we were also getting the online deliveries racked upon one another. We only had one delivery guy, and it was getting hectic with people coming in and calling in. It was very busy, and the kitchen and the work environment in the kitchen was getting heated too. And because of the orders coming in, it was getting very problematic to keep the track of order. And even the people sitting in the place were getting impatient with their orders, while some were leaving, 
Some were just constantly shouting at us to hurry up, and I was busy apologizing for the delay. I forget to keep an eye on the kitchen, and things were getting way out of hand there. The kitchen staff was busy fighting each other because it was a chaos in there, and people outside weren't really helping. And then one of our workers snapped, and he burnt his hand and shouted, Fuck! which scared a lot of people. But there was this one dude, he was the customer, and he just wouldn't stop shouting at us and the staff, and was getting on the nerves of everyone in there. While everyone else was busy attending to the worker to dilute the situation, I just passed on the fresh garlic bread batch free of cost to everyone in the room. And when I gave that man the bread, he threw it from my hand and said, I want my order, not this second hand donation asshole. Bring me my order. And I said very calmly, it will be out sir, things are very busy and we are a bit short staffed. And he replied, not my fucking problem. And I said, I will be back with your order, and went away. I saw that he started harassing one of our injured staff members, saying mean things to me and using racial slurs at him from a distance. I said, sir, please stop harassing our employee. But he wouldn't buzz, and suddenly he started being physical with him, and started slapping him on his head, pushing him to do his job. And when the employee retaliated, he took the gun out and raised it and said, you don't have nothing to say, motherfucker, do you? And that was the breaking point for me. I jumped over the counter, looked at the man, and I quickly approached him and he pointed the gun at me. Before he could, I used an Americana, one of the jujitsu moves on him, and brought him down, disarming him. And then one of the people in the dominoes called the police and the man was apprehended. He had the courage to point the firearm in a public place and endanger so many lives around him. If I was not the one to act, I wonder what irrational decision he would have made. I am just glad that I knew enough martial art to put him down. But then again, a gun most of the time, it won't really work. So keep your distance with sociopath like that. That night was long, but thankfully it ended without harming anyone. Well, anyone but one of our employees who got his hand burnt. But in the end, everyone was back at their house for Christmas in time though I definitely had something else in store for me. After closing the dominoes and on my way home, a car stopped in and a bunch of guys stepped out and beat the shit out of me. And one of them was the same guy from the altercation, the guy I took down. Turns out, he had the pull in the police force and was let go with mere warning. They beat the light out of me. And I remember the last thing he said. Not so tough now, huh, pizza boy? From that day and today, I wished I crossed roads with him again. I bet he wouldn't want to cross me right now, now that I have the black belt. My 20th birthday was definitely one to remember. Firstly, it was the first birthday I celebrated with a night on the town. From May 18th and 19th, me and my mates were all too broke to drop any serious cash anywhere, so we contented ourselves by getting sloshed in the park or in one of our bedrooms. By the time I hit 20, we could actually afford a proper night out. Needless to say, it was one of the best nights of my life. I was always a bit nervous about clubbing. We hear some horror stories about people getting spiked or glassed and roughed up by bouncers. But we ended up having a great night, a relatively tame one, I'm sure, but it was still one of the best nights of my life, right up until it turned into one of the worst. Turns out we had such a good time that none of us remembered to keep any taxi fare in reserve. So when the time came for the club lights to come on and the bouncers started kicking people out, we realized that if we wanted to go home, we were walking. It wasn't all that far, but given how drunk we were, an hour's walk would be more like an hour and a half, maybe two. So we set off, causing chaos as we walked down the center of dead streets, stealing traffic cones as we went. There were five of us when we started the walk, but gradually we were hitting people's houses on our route, and the group got smaller and smaller until it was just me and my friend Chris. As I said, I know this was stupid, but since it was like half five in the morning and the roads were all but deserted, we were just stumbling around down the middle of the road. Which was why I suppose I shouldn't have been surprised when we're blinded by some car's headlights as it came speeding around the corner at us. 
We tried our best to dodge it, but I'm pretty sure the driver swerved too. But the car ended up clipping my mate's hip with the impact spinning him like a top right there in the road. The car screeches to a stop, and I hear the driver's door open, and then the sound of my mate groaning from the impact. I look up and see the driver walking toward me, and I'm already apologizing him, which strikes me in the most British thing ever. Now that I think about it, I got my phone out, and I'm literally plugging 999 under the touchscreen. So when I see the driver with his phone out, I tell him like, Nah man, I'm calling the Ambo, don't worry about it. But he didn't get his phone out to call the paramedics, because the next thing I know, he's pointing his phone at me before the flash suddenly blinds me. He'd taken a picture of me, then he did the same with Chris, angled his phone to get a good picture of his face too. And that's when I realized something was wrong. Well, more wrong than getting clipped by a car. Not only did the bloke take a picture of us, he didn't seem in the least bit concerned that he just hit one of us. He just took his photos and started looking around like he was lost or something. I later realized that he was probably just looking for witnesses or cameras, but at the time, he looked completely mental, and given that he wasn't helping us, I started to get angry. Mate, what are you doing? Give us a hand here! I remember saying I wanted them to help move Chris out of the road, not knowing that's the opposite of what you're supposed to do. But instead of even trying to help, he pulls his hood up, turns around to us, and starts showing us the pictures he'd taken of us on his phone. Not a word to anyone about this. We know what you look like, and we'll be coming for you if you talk. I remember thinking that he just didn't want to get into trouble. Maybe he was appointed to away from a driving ban, and to drunk lads walking in the middle of the roads weren't going to be the thing that took him down. Shocked when not surprised. People could be mega scummy when they want to be, but then something happened. I started realizing that the noise my mate was making sounded way more muffled than it should have been. And then in actuality, he hadn't been making any noise at all. He must have landed almost right on his chin because he was knocked out cold. So if it wasn't him that was making the noise, who was? And as the driver walked back to his car, that's when the penny dropped. The muffled groaning noise wasn't coming from my mate, they were coming from the boot of his fellow's car. Before the horror of what was happened could really sink in, the wheels of the car screeched before it sped off the road. There were a few seconds where I think I was just in pure shock. It wasn't until I could hear the 999 operator talking on the phone that I came to and just hung up. I was too afraid, and I thought blokes only locked people in air boots doing cartoonish Guy Ritchie films. I didn't think it actually happened for real. And I'm incredibly claustrophobic to the idea of being locked in the booth. It's an actual living nightmare for me. I just stayed there, kneeling next to Chris until he suddenly came to. He had a few cuts and abrasions inside his mouth, which looked a bit scary because of all the blood. But it turned out that he'd be fine. He had some horrible bruising on his hips the next day, probably a concussion. But he was good to walk home, even if it was pretty painful. Thank God for the booze that keeps you lumber, and I don't think I'd have been able to get him home. Otherwise, he didn't remember what happened at all. I guess as a result of being killed and knocked that memory out real quick. But I promised to tell him when he was sober. The next day, I caught him as he was about to go to the local walk-in treatment center with his mom. It took some explaining, but once it made it very clear that some very, very bad things might happen to us if we reported that what happened was a hit and run. He started to relent. It didn't matter if we were in the middle of the road. The car had hit him and then bailed, which was something that the police would be very keen on investigating, and I needed him to admit those details. And if that was the case, some very bad man had actual pictures of us, stuff they could distribute if they really needed to. We'd never be safe. They could just put a price on our heads or something and desperate enough for the cash would just take us out. That's how it is around here. And that's how Chris ended up insisting to his mom that what had happened to him was just when he got a little too sloshed and took a tumble down some steps. 
That's all they really need to know, and they will just go from there and treat him as need be. But a few days of mild pain were considerably preferable to what I was fearing of a permanent dirt nap. And so just like we were told, we kept our golf shots and kept our health. After all, I was worried that if we blabbed about what we'd seen, neither of us would be around to see my 21st. This incident happened to me during the winter season of 2012, when I was in my second year of graduation. I lived in the capital city of Ukraine with my father, mother, and my younger sister, who was just 12 at that time. My grandparents were also alive, but they didn't like the noise of vehicles and crowds of the cities, so they lived in a small village where there was our farmhouse that my father constructed, and only for them. Our farm was not too far from the capital city. It was about three hours away from the place where we were currently living. As usual, I was going to my college, and since I woke up late, I couldn't eat breakfast or take a bath. I just prepared my bag and left for college. Luckily, I reached there on time. That day, there was a birthday party that one of my classmates threw on the occasion of his birthday. Many of us didn't want to miss our classes, so after a long round of discussion, we all came to a point where we would go and celebrate his birthday. After our college hours, we all went to the market as planned to celebrate his birthday and had a lot of fun. Since it was winter and it was getting colder by the minute, I took my leave from there and returned home directly. My mother was waiting for me, and as soon as I returned home, she started lecturing me about coming home on time and blah blah blah. She scolded me enough until I started to feel upset. My mood was off after listening to her lecture, so I went directly to my washroom to take a bath. Since it was winter, I couldn't afford to bathe in cold water. So I turned on the geyser and went to my sister's room to check on her. But I found that she was already in her deep sleep. I thought to peep into my dad's room and found that he was packing his stuff. It looked like he was planning to go somewhere. My mother was also standing there and she was also packing her dresses into the same bag. I was kind of clueless about this, so I pushed the door and asked them directly. They told me that my grandpa was ill and that they needed to go and check on him. That day, first I got back late from college, got scolded by my mom, and now my parents were going out to visit my grandparents. I went upstairs to my room, took my towel, and went to the washroom to get bathed. Before going to my parents' room, I forgot to turn off the geyser. The washroom was filled with steam and white mist. In fact, that mist was giving me the feeling of being in a sauna. While I was taking a bath, I thought I heard something. It was misty all around the washroom, so nothing was visible, but I was sure that I saw something. It was pitch black, and as I was struggling to open my eyes, I saw a ghostly figure with long hair standing in front of me. I was shocked, and my whole body started shaking after seeing that figure. After watching that pitch black figure, my heart just stopped for a second, and out of reflex, I threw the jug at his face as hard as I could. Ouch! The figure screamed. What the hell? After listening to its voice, I started to wonder, how can a ghost feel pain? I got up from the bathing tub and slowly went towards them. I was afraid 
and was shaking in my boots, but I wanted to know why that figure screamed like a human child. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was my younger sister who was sitting there just holding her head. It was because I'd hit her with the bucket. And that was when I knew why this ghost screamed like a human, and why it felt pain. She was sleeping with her hair open, and felt nature's call, so she came to the washroom. She was half asleep, so I didn't think it was right to discuss anything about what I had experienced, so I took her to her room and asked her to get some sleep. After all of this, I was just sure about one thing. Ghosts don't feel pain. In late 2016, the father of British entrepreneur Tim Stokely gave him a loan of £10,000. It wasn't the first time Tim had received a business loan, and as much as he assured his father that he'd return every penny of it, Guy Stokely was skeptical. One of the handful of loans he'd already given his son, Tim had failed to pay any of them back in full. This is going to be the last one the guy reportedly told him. It was Tim's last best chance, and he was determined not to screw it up. So in November of 2016, Tim founded the website, one designed for use by artists, performers, and content creators of all varieties to provide video clips and photographs to monthly subscribers. Tim's brother Thomas became the company's operating officer, while Guy occupied the rather fitting position of chief financial officer. All that was left to do was come up with a name for the company, and together they decided to call it OnlyFans. Initially, OnlyFans catered to a small but fairly lucrative clientele. It didn't exactly make Tim Stokely an overnight millionaire, but it was definitely more successful than any of his previous ventures. However, many of his fellow entrepreneurs noticed the untapped potential of such a business, noting low overhead costs and boundless availability, and it wasn't long before one of them made their move. Two years after the company's founding, Ukrainian-American business magnate Lenoid Redfinsky contacted the Stokely family with an offer they couldn't refuse for an undisclosed sum, but Vinsky acquired a 75% stake in OnlyFans' parent company, effectively gaining complete control of the business. Although the exact amount isn't readily available online, the fact that Tim now lives in a gated mansion with a cinema and sauna in Bishop Stanford Hartshire Fire, we can safely assume it was an obscene amount of money. But Red Minsky didn't just recognize the company's potential, he had a vision for it. You see, previous to purchasing OnlyFans where Davinsky had owned and operated the adult-oriented webcam site My Free Cams, and given that he understood how lucrative such an industry was, he knew that if he pushed OnlyFans into the explicit direction he had in mind, he had a potential billion-dollar business idea on his hands. But mid-2019, OnlyFans had become one of the primary sources of amateur adult-themed content on the internet, charging just a 20% fee for all transactions. OnlyFans seemingly took all the selling power out of the hands of the adult industry and put it right into the hands of its user. And as a result, one news outlet noted that OnlyFans had gained a pop culture reputation for being a hive of adult-themed content. It wasn't until April 2020 that the website truly exploded, when Beyonce Knowles released a remix of the Megan Thee Stallion song Savage. The remix included the lyric, Hips Tick Tock When I Dance. On the demon time, she went start and only fans. Listeners rushed to find out what Beyonce was referencing. And what followed was a boom in popularity that no social media site had ever experienced before. CEO Tim Stokely claimed OnlyFans was seeing about 200,000 new users every 24 hours, and 7,000 to 8,000 new creators joining every day. By August, American actress Bella Thorne reportedly earned $1 million in 24 hours after opening a profile on the site, and watershed movement in the what had become a burgeoning story of guerrilla adult content. As of today, 
OnlyFans has over 2 million content creators and more than 130 million users, and one of those users is named Kathleen West. 42-year-old Kathleen Cat West met her husband Jeff West at a 2004 Super Bowl party. Jeff was working as a recruiter for the U.S. Army at the time, and after chatting and swapping contact information at the party, the pair began dating. It seemed that they had fallen in love pretty quickly, because it only took four months for Jeff to propose marriage. Cat accepted and the couple tied the knot after traveling from their humble Alabama home to the bright lights of Las Vegas. The relationship continued to move at a rapid pace, with their first child arriving in 2005. And although Jeff's job took him all over the deep south, their nomadic lifestyle didn't seem to dampen their romance, and for a long, long time, Kat and Jeff were still very much in love. In 2014, the West moved to a small Alabama city of about 15,000 known as Calera. Jeff had retired from the Army by this point, but soon found work at a Camas police station at the nearby Birmingham Southern College. The only trouble was, the job didn't bring in nearly as much income as his recruiter position did, leaving the young family's finances with a sizable hole in it. But around 18 months after the move, Kat had an idea to bring in a second income for the family. After hearing of a little website known as OnlyFans, she started up a profile under the username Kitty Cat West, and over the weeks and months that followed, found herself gaining a few hundred subscribers from the risque photos she posted. But without a doubt, the most lucrative part of her new modeling gig was a specific request she'd received from followers. If Kat dressed, posed, or behaved in a specific way, certain subscribers would tip her double, sometimes even triple their subscription amount. It seems at first Jeff was more than happy to help her bring in the second income, and even took us some of the more revealing photos himself which makes what happened next and the ultimate explanation for it make very little sense at all. Cut in the night of January 12, 2018. Jeff and Kat were out on a date, something they did regularly as a way of keeping their marriage fresh and healthy. While the couple's 12-year-old daughter Logan was spending the night at Jeff's parents' place, like most of their date nights, the couple attended a fancy dinner at an upmarket restaurant, drinking multiple bottles of wine in the process. At around 8.45 p.m., Kat and Jeff stopped by a liquor store and were filmed by the establishment's security cameras purchasing additional bottles of alcohol. When they arrive back home, they are carried on drinking for a while when Kat changed in some lingerie before asking Jeff to take her picture. What happened between them in the following morning had been hotly disputed by both professionals and amateur sleuths alike, but the facts remain that as the sun rose on the 13th of January, a neighbor discovered Kat's lifeless body lying on the sidewalk opposed the West's abode. Lying next to her was a half-empty bottle of liquor, as well as her cell phone. The cause of death was later determined to be an acute skull fracture, caused by a single heavy blow from a blunt object. There was no sign of the need loot interference with her body. Now though, a closer examination revealed that she had recently made love. Her blood alcohol content was 0.23, which is just shy of three times the legal drunk driving limit, so there's no doubt that she was highly intoxicated at the time of her death. As you can imagine, one of the first people the police suspected of being the murderer was Kat's husband, Jeff. He was taken in for an interview in the local police precinct and supposedly lasted over five hours. And after his release, those they interviewed him announced that he was cooperating with their investigation. But the police also investigated a number of suspects they believe Kat had come in contact with via her OnlyFans site, or the several social media pages connected within it. Given the nature of her content, police began to theorize that an obsessive or disgruntled fan might be to blame, and that Kat's work had earned her a stalker that would eventually work up to taking her life. Investigators found very little evidence of any interactions with a homicidal stalker. But an absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, and there's little doubt that Kat had several extremely devoted fans whose interest in her verged into the unhealthy. Regardless, the police decided that Jeff was their best shot, 
and shortly after he was arrested on suspicion of murder. During his arraignment, the prosecution ordered Jeff what's commonly known as an Alford plea. This is when a defendant maintains their innocence, but also while admitting that the prosecutor has enough evidence to convict him of the crime in question. Had Jeff accepted, he would have done time served than just a two-year probationary sentence, essentially absolving him of his wife's murder in what the prosecutor assumed was a classic crime of passion. This is just what the sweetest deal that any spousal murderer could possibly find in front of them. The idea of allowing the illegal system to brand him a man that murders his wife. That was simply unacceptable to Jeff, and he decided to take the case to trial in order to completely clear his name. This means that either Jeff was arrogant to the point of delusion, or Jeff really was innocent of Kat's murder. Before his murder trial was due to begin, Jeff was offered yet another plea deal by the prosecution, but again, this is flatly rejected by a man who is dead fast in his declaration of innocence. Jeff was being advised by his defense attorney that the prosecution's case was flimsy and that they barely had enough for a conviction. But the prosecution had a trick up their sleeve. They asked the judge if any additional last-minute charge could be added to Jeff's rap sheet. One known as reckless manslaughter, they carried a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. They know that if all the details of the case come out, that it would be almost impossible to convince the jury that what happened that night was outright murder. The paint, the killing is a crime of passion and charged him with a lesser crime, and the jury might concur enough for them to land a guilty verdict. It worked, and Jeff was convicted and sentenced to 16 years in prison. But the question remains. Was Jeff West actually responsible for the death of his wife? Well, not only did Jeff have ample opportunity to commit the crime, but it's difficult to argue against the idea that Kat was doing things both online or offline that could have made Jeff angry, possessive, or overtly jealous. On top of that, the bottle of liquor found near Kat's corpse had Jeff's fingerprints on it that might well be expected given it was the same one they had purchased just a few hours previously. But as the prosecution pointed out, Jeff's fingerprints appeared in an inverted pattern, indicating that he held the bottle upside down at some point, possibly during the act of hitting Cat over the head with it. The prosecution also pointed out that the bottle had a sliver of glass missing from it, but this could have just easily been incurred if Cat had tripped and fallen at any point. However, the positioning of the bottle leading perfectly at Cat's cell phone was deeply suspicious and the prosecution argued that it had been deliberately placed there by Jeff after he struck her with it. There was also Jeff's apparent lack of emotion, as one witness put it. Upon discovering that his wife's corpse had been found, he didn't ask for any updates or details on her condition, and this is very inconsistent with commonly agreed upon innocent behavior. There were also several instances in Jeff's version of events. First, he told the police that he went to bed alone at around 10.30 that evening. However, a health-related application on his cell phone showed that he was up and moving around just past 11 p.m. Jeff also said that the next time he awoke was the following morning when his dogs began to bark at the attending police officers in the street outside. A neighbor testified that he saw Jack pacing back and forth much earlier than the cops showed up, almost as if he thought he was worried about something. Here's what the police claimed had happened. They claimed text messages showed that an argument was unfolding on the same night of the murder. Jeff was unhappy with Kat's ever-increasing drinking habits, as well as her increased interactions with her OnlyFans followers. Kat's phones was cracked when her body was found, and while Jeff claimed this was from where she fell, homicide detectives assert that it occurred when he tossed her phone out into the streets in an act of rage. As she went to retrieve the phone, she took the bottle of alcohol with her in a drunken rage. Jeff followed her out into the street, grabbed the bottle from her, and hit her over the head with it. While Jeff insisted that Kat had simply fallen, police argued that such an impact would have knocked her out cold. But if that was the case, why were there two bulls of blood at the crime scene? Sure. It was feasible that Kat hit her head, stood up, and then fell over again, but the prosecution argued this was highly unlikely. Not only that, 
but the damage done to her score would have been impossible to achieve through an accidental fall alone, especially when Kat's height was factored into the equation. Therefore, it stands to reason that Jeff had hit her over the head with the bottle and that this was the blunt force trauma that ended her life. It's a sad reality that many spouses or partners of OnlyFans users have reacted badly to their online presence, and we can understand their irrational possessiveness or jealousy might cause Jeff to act in a violent or controlling manner. But Jeff had absolutely no history of violence. By all accounts, he was an exemplary soldier with a pristine disciplinary record. Police also failed to find any blood on Jeff's clothes or any other indiscriminating tissue for that matter, which amounts to a solid example of what we'd call reasonable doubt. Kat also had a history of falling over whilst intoxicated, an inevitable result of her love for hard liquor and six-inch heels. And while it's not certain that a fault killed her, it's not an overly outrageous explanation. It's also very possible that Kat may have picked up two, one or two obsessed fans as a result. Having her online presence, she was posting pictures on OnlyFans for years and engaged with scores of users to fulfill personal requests or one to two interactions. It seems much more likely that one of these users could be overwhelmed with jealousy given Kat's marital status, especially Jeff was apparently just fine with Kat's online activity, so much so that he participated in the creation of it. Is it possible that some maniacal online stalker managed to catch Kat standing drunk in the streets, then managed to kill her in a way that his completely innocent man could be implicated? The horrifying thing about this case is that's very, very possible. So no matter how you look at it, and as unjust and tragic as it may be, Having an OnlyFans account may well have been a direct contributor to a woman's burial and untimely murder. Back when I was in college, I used to work evening shifts and an independent coffee shop that happened to be right next door to this little bagel place. I think there must have been some degree of collusion between the two owners, as the bagel place was geared to be like a health nut place, whereas all the baked goods the coffee shop produced had like diabetes inducing levels of sugar in them. So naturally, I'd often gone to the bagel place to grab a bite to eat before clocking in for my shift. Since the sugar craft that followed, one of the cinnamon buns was about as debilitating as they come. But that's how I met Tom. Tom worked full time at the bagel place, and he was there to take my order like 9 out of 10 times that I stopped by. It wasn't long before he knew my order off by heart. Shortly after that, we were on first name terms, and the more familiar we got, the more little gentle flirting entered into our daily exchanges. Wasn't mad about it? He was kind of cute, and it certainly didn't sting that he started giving me discounts. After a month or so, he asked me if I have a boyfriend. I said no. So he asked me if I'd like to grab a drink or something after our shift ends. The bagel place in the coffee shop closed within a half an hour of each other. I said sure, because why not, right? But oh my god. If I'd have known that kind of guy Tom was and have just resigned myself to getting fat from the Danishes at work, a few extra pounds would be easy to shake. But a full-blown stalker, not so much. Okay, so I didn't meet Tom after work that day, as I was too busy with an upcoming deadline. However, we did arrange to meet over the weekend, so we could see if we click. It definitely wasn't the greatest state I'd ever been on, like I don't think whatever chemistry we had really translated into a social conversational setting, but I didn't write them off altogether, and we agreed to go out next time we were both free. It's so weird to think he actually gave me space at first, like we went 48 hours at a time without talking sometimes. It really did seem chill. But then came the day when I walked into the bagel place and the manager was working the evening shift. This is highly out of the ordinary. So I asked her if Tom was sick or something. It's then she hits me with Tom isn't employed here anymore. We decided it was best that we parted ways. I'm shocked. So while I'm waiting for my order, I text Tom to ask him what the heck happened with his parting ways business. He replies pretty quickly. 
telling me that the manager had caught him giving me a discount and fired him as a result. Immediately, I felt terribly guilty, and I get the idea that if I pay off the difference from what was owed, I could maybe talk her into giving him his old job back. So right when I collected my bagel, I politely offered to pay back the discount if she considered offering Thomas's job back. I kind of embellished a little, making out that I'm the one who manipulated him into doing it, and the whole time the manager has this wow expression on her face. I think I'm making a solid point. She comes back with, Oh, is that what he told you? According to her, Tom hadn't been fired for giving discounts. It was her own policy that employees of local businesses get money off their food. He'd been fired because she'd received a number of complaints from female customers regarding his behavior towards them. His no was the flirt a little offered discounts, then eventually asked for the number. Those who handed it over didn't have a problem. Those that refused got cussed out before he refused service altogether. She claimed she actually had security footage of him going off when a customer and some of the language he used was absolutely abhorrent. She planned on giving him a final warning over the incident that she prefers to work with and mentor junior staff instead of just kicking them to the curb. But the one thing she can't deal with is liars. Not realizing the footage came with audio, to Tom tries to lie his way out of the predicament by claiming the disagreement was because the lady had tried to give him a fake $10 bill. That's like a pathological level of dishonesty, right? They're still insisting on the lies when confronted with overwhelming evidence to the contrary. I just remember apologizing for the intrusion and thanked her for setting me straight before I headed over to work to clock in. Tom was still expecting a reply at that point, but I just had no idea what to say to him. I wasn't even sure if I was ever going to talk to him again. I mean, that could have been me getting cussed out if I had the gall to turn them down. When I finished my shift, I got my phone out of my purse and I find that I had a grand total of 12 butt notifications, all with Tom's name attached. They started off all gentle at first, have a good shift, text me when you finish, etc. But around 8pm, there was obviously a point where he learned of the interaction between me and his formal manager, and he was not happy about that, not one bit. Oh, so you're just going to believe the exploitative employer over the person she's been taking advantage of? This is exactly what's wrong with the American labor market. Even the workers are bootlickers was the general tone of his messages. I'm not even saying I entirely disagree, but the whole thing left such a bad taste in my mouth, but I wasn't interested in seeing him at all. When I got home from work, I blocked Tom's number, deleted my contact details, and figured that would be that. But oh, how wrong I was. A few days later, I'm working the evening shift, crouched down, stocking the mini fridge. I finish up, close the fridge. Then when I stand and turn around, Tom stood at the register. I tried to be as warm and friendly as possible, asking how he's been and stuff. But I completely avoid the fact that we haven't spoken since his little text tirade. At first, I think I dodged a bullet as he's perfectly civil and goes on to order a drink. But like, right as I'm handing him his drink, he decides to make it super, super awkward. So I guess you're pretty much done with me, hmm. He didn't say it in that particularly aggressive way, but it was loud and jarring enough to attract the attention of almost everyone in the store. I feel like I'm about to cringe out of existence, but somehow I maintain my corporal form and say in as lower a voice as possible, this isn't the time or place. Please drop it. He just smiles, nods, and starts walking away. But instead of actually walking out of the door like I thought it was going to, he just takes a seat right in the middle of the store and proceeds to just stare at the register area in between baby sits of this coffee. And that's basically how it started. Tom would show up for coffee almost every time I was working, and every time he would just sit there for like an hour, staring me down whenever I was at the register. He was never rude or awkward about it, not after the initial incident anyway. 
So despite the fact that my boss had assured me that any funny business would result in a lifetime ban, he was reluctant to kick him out for being a little weird as he phrased it. That got to be a kind of running joke about it to everyone calling him Vicky Stalker, and I have to admit that one about upselling the Portuguese custard tarts until he was too fat to chase me. That one really didn't make me smile. But boy did that stop being funny. After the first time, he followed me home. After that, things got serious. I called the cops, got some advice from their fixated persons unit, and they actually paid Tom a visit to warn him off stalking me. But apparently, he was only deterred for about a week, and what followed was a painfully slow escalation of intensity that culminated in the following. And that the two dozen times had followed me up till that point, Tom had either stayed on the street corner and watched me walk into my building, or stood outside the building and looked up at the windows like he was trying to work out exactly which unit I was in. But on the day in question, I was so used to him keeping his distance that I didn't even notice that he was almost right behind me by the time I got to my door. Seeing him so close actually elicited the kind of squeal from me oh, I'm definitely not proud of. But Jesus Christ, seeing him right there just about scared the poop out of me. I absolutely bowled it inside, never been so grateful that the lock was operated by a key fob instead of an actual key. Tom just stayed at the door, banging on it, and telling me to get my butt out there, that I had to be an adult and talk to him about it. Whatever it was, since he was banging on the door and screaming in the street, I was totally freaking out. And naturally, my first move is to call the cops, but I think he was banging so hard, acting like I was the one inside because the building I live in at the time looked exactly like all the other family homes on the block. To him, I could have quite easily been the only person living there only. That wasn't quite the case. I had the top floor of the house. Well, the bottom floor was occupied entirely by this Puerto Rican guy who worked night shifts. Keep in mind that this whole thing is going on in a Saturday afternoon. Smack bang in the middle of this guy's sleeping time. So while I'm praying for the cops to show up in time, an unlikely savior is about to come to my rescue. So imagine you're me. Oh, you can hear us. Biggie. If you think that you can just punk guys like me and I'll face the consequences, you're dumber than you look. Bang, bang, bang. The out of nowhere and even deeper, louder voice starts booming over the first like, Hey, are you crazy? I'm trying to sleep here. My neighbor from downstairs. His name actually turned out to be Luis, is wearing nothing but a pair of shorts, and he's screaming in Thomas' face as he backs down the steps of our building. Tom starts saying something back to him, but Luis keeps shouting over him, telling him to get lost. Get it doesn't like he's interested in backing down just yet. Then again, out of nowhere, I hear Luis say, Oh, you're gonna tase me, bro before the confrontation gets physical. Everyone else in the streets is fixated on the fist fight that's now going down, but all I can focus on is what Luis said, tase me. Tom and brought a taser, presumably to use on me. Now by that point, because the cops were getting called about the fight on top of my stocking complaint, a marked patrol car rolls onto the scene. With a by now bloody Tom trying to walk away from the scene, the cops initially go for Lewis, drawing their guns and demanding a show of hands. Buddy responds with, hey, I'm the victim here. This guy just tried to tase me. The cops and I watch as Tom starts to walk faster away from the scene, which obviously prompts the cops to chase him down and arrest him for carrying a concealed weapon or whatever they had in mind. Finally, my stalker was in police custody, only wouldn't catch charges for the actual stalking. He ended up going to jail for the one thing cops could stick to him, the contents of his backpack. On the one day that Tom had decided to act on this little fixation and move in to take me, or whatever, he had come with a pre-prepared kidnap kit, along with a few other choice items. According to the detective I spoke to after the fact, 
Tom had chosen to confront me that day while carrying duct tape, a length of electrical cord, a kind of retractable baton, and a box of 100 different contraceptives. For some reason, is that last part that particularly creeped me out. Not so much their inclusion, but the sheer freaking number of them. At his trial for conspiracy to commit kidnapping, Tom's attorney argued the state was trying to wrongfully prosecute a man who had been unfortunate enough to be assaulted by an unhinged parolee, whilst caring nothing more about malicious than home supplies. The persecution had a different story. Not only had they obtained CCTV image of Tom showing up at my job on a total of 31 separate occasions over the course of two months, but a search of his home had turned up some extremely disturbing discoveries. What Tom had in his backpack that day was just a fraction of the kidnap kit that it assembled. He in all kind of handcuffs, ankle cuffs, ring gags, and latex masks. But by far the most disturbing was the surgical tools and the Siva flooring canister face mask combo. Yeah, I had to ask what Siva flooring was too. It turns out, it's similar to chloroform that knocks you out, stuff that you put on a rack. He had tons of creepy stuff on his hard drive, including guides to kidnapping, hiding, and eventually breaking his prospective victims through a combination of brainwashing and beating. He also had a bunch of foreign language comic books that seemed to focus heavily on carnal torture. I suppose you could say. The prosecution just piled on all this evidence until it was quite clear to both the judge and jury that Tom was an extremely dangerous individual. I was terrified it escaped justice via some loophole or something. Maybe he'd have rich parents who could pay for some smart lawyer. But no. Not even his clean rap sheet saved him from getting a solid 22-year sentence for conspiracy to commit kidnapping. As you can imagine, it was quite an ordeal, and I had to make a number of court appearances to confirm that I was one of the subjects of his many fixations. It was the most stressful experience of my life without a shadow of a doubt, and a part of me wonders just how many of those 22 years he'll really end up doing. And when he does get out, will he really have changed? Or am I going to be walking on my driveway one day when I feel a hand on my shoulder? My goodness, turn around and see the face of a man who wants to finish what he started. I come from a South Asian country where it's kind of unsafe for a girl to go out on solo adventures. That being said, there are some states which are relatively safe. 2019 had been a rough year for me, but by October I'd started feeling better and decided to take a solo trip for my birthday. I spoke to some friends and decided to head to the small village down south. My brother helped convince my overprotective mother as he'd already been there, but to put her mind at ease, I decided to grab some pepper spray. Unfortunately, we couldn't find one, so I kept a bottle of deodorant and a knife handy. I decided to stay there for five days and booked a room at a guest house for only two days, thinking I would check out this guest house that my friend had suggested and hopefully spend the remainder of my stay there. To tell you a little more about this village, it's a hippie paradise if you know what I mean. Everyone is extremely friendly and warm, and they have tourists coming from all over the globe. Once I got to the run, I was a little paranoid because it seemed a little dingy. Forget about security systems, the latch on the door was barely functional. The first night was a bit unsettling, but nothing happened. The next day was my birthday, so I rented a bike and went out exploring the village. Sometime after lunch, I decided to check out the guest house that my friend had recommended, which was a little secluded, but extremely peaceful. As I reached there, I was greeted by the owner who showed me around this place. Had big cuts on one side and a small roll of rooms on the opposite side. I decided to take the latter as it was much cheaper and I didn't plan on being in the room much anyway. We exchanged numbers and I told him I'd move in the next day. The next day, I got there and had lunch with the owner and he told me about the history of the place and a bit about himself. I realized that he wasn't around when my friend had been there, 
I was trying to read him, see if I was getting creepy vibes from him, since I was going to be spending two nights there, but I didn't see any red flags in particular. After lunch, I went to a restaurant that was right behind the guest house. I met some of the locals whom I was already acquainted with. Along with them, there were two new guys, one of whom was from the city. The three of us instantly clicked and started hanging out. Once it got dark, we came back to my guest house to chill. When the older told us that he was planning a bonfire with some of his guests slash friends who were sitting at another table, an hour passed, we ate played cards, and the guys didn't seem like they were much in the mood for bonfire and left shortly after. So the owner had already set things up. We decided to spend some time by the fire with them. We were all sitting and chatting until midnight, when the other two boys decided to take off as they weren't staying there. I told the owner that I headed back to my room too. He tried to convince me to stay out a bit longer, but I didn't want to be alone with them. My room door had four to five locks, but only two of them worked, so I locked them and realized that the windows facing each other did not have any panes, and the curtains were made of scraps of cloth which meant that anyone could peek inside to see everything. So I went to the bathroom to change and clean up. As soon as I stepped out and started rummaging through my back, I heard someone whisper my name twice. My heart skipped a beat and I froze for a few seconds. I decided to ignore it and quickly turned out all the lights. Before going to bed, I decided to keep the bin right in front of the door in case someone tried to open it. At least, that would make noise. I took out my deodorant and knife and kept it right next to me on the pillow before laying in bed. I kept looking at both of the windows on the side to see if anyone was out there. About an hour and a half later, the metallic door started rattling violently as if someone was trying to force it open. Instantly I stood up and got a hold of the knife and deodorant. My mouth went dry and my heart started beating fast. I didn't know if I should scream because I only knew of one other girl who was staying in the opposite heart. After what felt like forever, the door stopped shaking and I collapsed onto the bed. I checked the windows to see if anyone was walking by, but no one did. I tried to think of what it could have been. Maybe it was the wind, but the curtains hadn't moved from one bit. It had to have been a person. I don't know when, but I passed out soon after. I wake up around 6 a.m. to see that it was almost bright outside. I closed my eyes and tried to go back to sleep. But when it started happening again, frantically, I shot up in bed, ready to attack. But once again, it stopped after a few minutes. I didn't even understand what was happening. Was it even real? I went closer to the door and got to look at the bend that I had kept by the door that had moved away from its original position. Yes, something had definitely happened. Not knowing what to do, I opted to go back to sleep. When I got out of the room later, I tried to read the owner's face, but it was just as hard to read as the day before. What worried me the most was that I had to spend another night in that room. I decided to not let that thought spoil the day, and went out with the two friends I'd made for a track and then watched the sunset from the hilltop where all the locals gathered to play music in the evenings, including the owner. My new friends and I were somewhere else after that, and at around 10, I decided to head back to the guest house for dinner. As I was nearing the pool, I got a text from the owner asking me where I was. I didn't think much of it because it was late, and he was probably wondering if I was safe. I didn't reply as we were almost there, when we sat down on the futon, the owner said I was just about to text you and showed me the message he typed on his phone. I was just thinking about you read the message, I'm not sure what that meant. So I looked at his face trying to read him and realized he was doing the same. I tried to act normal and told him where we were. We all sat met a couple of other people we smoked. At around 11, the guys decided to head to their guest house. At that point, I got up and told him I was going to my own room. He looked at the time and asked me why I was ending the night so early. 
I told him I was tired from all the walking and that I wanted to be up early. He didn't push any further because there were other people around. I went back to the room filled with anticipation and dread, but thankfully nothing happened that night. The next day I checked out, but my boss wasn't until 5 p.m. I didn't want to be left alone with the owner. So I met up with the guys leaving my luggage at the reception, which was also the eating area. When I came back, I picked up my bag, thanked him, and left. I still have no idea if it was the owner or the only helper that I'd seen around whoever it was trying to forcefully get through my door. Let's not meet. This happened in March of 2011, near my house in a small town about an hour north of Indianapolis, Indiana. I was in 8th grade at the time, and it was during my spring break. That year, instead of sunshine and warm weather for spring break, there was a snowstorm, probably around 8 inches or so of snow. My two friends, my two younger brothers and I, decided to make the best of it and just go play in the snow for the day. There was a woods near my house, not a huge woods, but big enough to hike around for a few hours, so we decided to do just that. About an hour into the hike, we stumbled on what looked like an old well, a stone circle about 10 feet in diameter and about 4 feet high off the ground, and particularly filled him with foul-smelling half-frozen water. We threw in a few rocks and stuck long tree branches in it to try and find out how deep it was. We tried with a branch that was at least 20 feet long, or we were never able to hit the bottom, so it was pretty deep down. Now the well by itself wasn't really creepy or anything by how old it looks, and the way it was just sticking out in the middle of the woods was a little unnerving. The part that really terrified us came about 20 minutes after discovering the well. We had decided that we were done messing around with the well and had just started to continue on to the woods, when we all heard something that made us freeze death in our tracks with fear. Echoing through the woods came a loud shrieking laugh. It was a high-pitched grating voice that was still very loud. Despite seeming like it came from somewhere far away, we all just froze for a moment, trying to make sense of what we'd heard. The laugh came again, this time distinctly closer to us, but still not in our immediate vicinity. At that moment, none of us were saying a word. We bolted back the way we came away from the sound in the direction of my house. We didn't stop running for what seemed like forever, and we eventually made it back to my house without any more incidents. None of us had a clue as to what we heard, and none of us were ever brave enough to go back there and try to figure it out. I would love to hear any thoughts about what it could have been, paranormal or otherwise. I probably don't have to tell you that kids aren't always the kindest of people. When you're growing up, you are learning wrong and right in real time. Kids often do and say things grown-ups would scoff at, some things you could call cruel, and none of us reached adulthood without being guilty of these misdemeanors either not even me. So many reach the end of the story and find me guilty of being one of the worst, and I'm willing to suffer that fate. I may even agree with you. After all, when I was 12, I helped kill a man. Once I reached the age of 14, I passed in the world of Latchkey Kid, a phenomenon I'm not even sure exists anymore. However, for a few years prior to that, I was forced to spend my time out of school at a local large-scale daycare center. I know my folks had no other choice at the time, but the experience was bristling, especially in the summers. I had been free to run unattended since birth. I still don't look back favorably on that time, and my feelings about being stuck in daycare is another story for another time. You're here to hear about my crime. Well, during summers, the daycare had to find a way to keep hundreds of kids, some almost as old as 16, busy. Since the center happened to be located near the downtown area, they used this to their advantage. Several attractions were within walking distance. The most often visited was my favorite was the city library. At least once a month, 
we'd been grouped together and marched the quarter of a mile or so to the place. On the walk there, the group would pass places like the old post office and several large churches. One of these churches had a spire that was easily 50 to 75 feet in the air. I'm not sure the exact height, but to the child's eyes, it might as well have been 1,000 feet. Someone had noticed a man working at the very top of the spire. I couldn't tell you what he was doing, but to us, he was a prime target for our harassment. I have no idea who said it first, but once the initial call for fall down, fall down was heard, most of the other boys joined in. It's not a thing I say with any pride, but that's what happened. The ghoulish chants went on for another few seconds until our monitor told us to shut up. Unfortunately, her demands came too late. No more had the yellow cease than a snapping was heard. The snapping was quickly followed by the horrible sight of the following man. Everyone had seen it happen. Fortunately, his body landed on the opposite side of the building, and young eyes were prevented from seeing his ultimate demise. As you can guess, the incident caused quite a stir. Several of the girls began screaming, crying. I was in total shock from my part. The lady did all she could do and rushes back to the daycare. I don't recall much discussion upon our return. The girls were comforted, and us boys, we may have mumbled a bit about it to our friends, but no one seemed to want to relieve it. These days, I'm sure droves of psychologists and counselors would have been called in to make us talk about it incessantly. This was the 80s, though. People dealt with trauma in much different ways. Whether you agree or not, that was the way things were around the center. The incident was quickly forgotten, although a kid would bring it up from time to time. Most of us, especially those who witnessed it, just wanted to forget. I still have no idea if my parents were notified about it. The last thing I wanted to do was bring it up to them. I like to act as if terrible things never happened, and it worked for me so far, and let's hope it continues to the poor man who died that day. I have no idea what unfolded afterwards. I assumed that he was some sort of construction worker looking back, seeing that he was sort of on some type of scaffolding at the time and was probably just doing some basic maintenance. The adults shielded us from any severe details beyond that, and I can't say I blame them. I tried to find as much information in the intervening years, but didn't find much as probably for the best. I'm sure his loved ones don't want to remember him by his manner of death. This may be the first time I've actually mentioned it to anybody who wasn't there that day. And I'm sure you're wondering the same thing I am. Did our yelling actually cause that poor man's death? That question will never be answered. I remember the sound of a snapping rope, but that might have been a coping mechanism. It's probably our jeering that caused him to become distracted and led to his horrible fall a mistake on the site. I like to think that he never even heard us, and circumstances were what they were. Does that remove that last bit of nagging doubt from my mind? I'll let you figure that last one out for yourself. Juzo Itami was a Japanese film director born in the city of Kyoto on May 15, 1933. From an early age, Jesus' profound intelligence and natural talent was obvious to the adults around him, and towards the end of World War II, educational authorities local to Kyoto selected him as a designated prodigy. This meant he was transferred to the Togobetsu Kagoku Kakyao, part of a government program to foster academic genius. The goal of this class was to reduce scientists capable of inventing and engineering superweapons that would be used to defeat the Allied powers. Essentially, the Japanese government wished to create a class of evil geniuses, and Juzo was one of them. But thankfully, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought the world to an end, and the special scientific education classes were eventually dissolved in March of 1947. Yet, as he grew older, Jews have found himself growing less and less interested in science and increasingly drawn to the medium of cinema. He started his career as an actor in the 1960s, 
Ginza Nodora Neko, but quickly found himself much more comfortable behind the camera. Going on to direct the 1984 hit comedy The Funeral, his movies became something of a phenomenon in the late 20th century Japan and were lauded was being funny and insightful. While remaining delightfully subtle, they often told stories that were central to the Japanese character, culture, and way of thinking, such as 1985's Tampopo, which tells the tale of a woman who set out to make the perfect noodle. But after establishing himself as Japan's premier comedic film producer, Juzo turned his attention to more serious subject matter. In 1992, Juzo held a mirror up to Japanese society when he made the film Minbar, a satire which poked fun at the traditional Japanese crime families known collectively as the Yakuza. The name Yakuza comes from a traditional Japanese card game known as Old Oishikubo, is a game where the aim is to draw three cards which add to a total score of nine. The rules of the game are fairly complex, but the worst possible three cards to draw are eight, nine, and three, pronounced Yaku-za in Japanese. The implication being that if you're in a situation where you're dealing with the Yakuza, you're in the worst situation possible. In the film, Mendo Jusa wrote that Yakuza as being big dumb bullies with a ridiculous dress sense and a perverse set of morals a set of morals which they believe made them as appearing as chivalrous samurai, but actually made them look archaic and foolish. The film culminates in the Yakuza family, in question being completely outwitted by a timid but intelligent female attorney, played by Jesus' wife, Nobuku Miyamoto. The film men and national laughingstock of the much-feared Yakuza and sparked off something of the judicial revolution in which the police stepped up their persecutions of Yakuza members, while media outlets began to refer to them as a Boryokodon, a disrespectful term meaning violent gangs. Naturally, Yakuza clans all over Japan were thoroughly outraged by the humiliating depiction of them, and some even sought direct revenge against Jews. Then, on May 22, 1992, Less than a week after the film's initial release in theaters, Juzo was accosted by several members of the Gotogumi, a Shizuka-based Yakuza clan, who demanded he apologize for the offense that it cost. However, instead of groveling, Juzo was defiant in the face of their threats and refused to be intimidated. The Yakuza then attacked, beating him senseless before slashing his face and shoulder with a traditional Japanese sword known as the Waxiashi, one that is similar in design, but not nearly as big as a katana. Used for close quarter fighting to behead a defeated opponent, and sometimes to commit seppuku, a form of ritually ending their own life. The brutal attack left Juzo with a large scar on his left cheek one that would become a symbol of his rebellious defiance, and made the director instantly recognizable when in public, as the attack quickly became national news. As you might expect, the attack didn't silence Juzo, and he went on to become a hugely vocal critic of the Yakuza, says flagrant disrespect for Japanese laws and society. The attack on him by the Gotogomi only caused the Japanese government and police to intensify their crackdown on the Yakuza, and a series of high-profile raid saw several 100 Yakuza arrested and charged with offenses ranging from murder and extortion to tax evasion. For the next five years, judo was a thorn in the Yakuza side, and it reached the point where several rival Yakuza families actually put their differences aside and met to discuss a permanent solution to the problematic celebrity nemesis. Then, on December 20th, 1997, but then 64-year-old director was found dead just outside of his home after apparently jumping off an eight-story roof and what was deemed to be a tragic event of him taking his own life. A popular Japanese celebrity gossip magazine had recently published an article alleging that Juzo was having a secret affair with a much younger actress with whom he had worked with on several occasions. Juzo denied the accusations in his notes that he had left 
and wrote that he would prove his innocence in a grand display of protest by taking his own life. This was viewed by some as highly suspicious, and although Japanese homicide detectives puzzled over the circumstances, it wasn't entirely unlike Juzo to react so passionately to a perceived injustice. However, and an interesting turn of events, Juzo, his wife, Nobuko Miyamoto, was subsequently placed under police protection, apparently to keep her safe from the Yakuza. But just why should she require police protection after her husband taking her own life was a mystery that would only be solved after an investigation by an American journalist. Jake Aldestein grew up in Columbia, Missouri, but moved to Japan at the tender age of 19 to study Japanese literature at Sophia University, one of the country's top private colleges. In 1993, Adelstein became the first non-Japanese staff writer at the Yomiuri Shimbui newspaper, where he worked for 12 years. After leaving the Yomiuri that Ustein published a series of articles on how you can use a bus to Damas Goto, made a deal with the FBI to inform on Yakuza incursions into the U.S. in exchange for a liver transplant at the University of California, Los Angeles. In 2019, Adelstein published a memoir about his career as a reporter in Japan, Tokyo, vice in which he accosts Goto of threatening to kill him over the story. It was a shocking exposure of just how deep the Yakuza influence still ran in Japanese society, and one part of the memoir proved to be a terrifying insight on just how much they hated director Juzo Itamai, an anonymous source told Adelstein that Dadi Masagoto, the same Yakuza boss who had ordered that scarring attack on Juzo in 1992, had visited him on the day of him apparently taking his life and ordered him to the roof of the building at gunpoint. He then gave Juzo a choice, jump from the eight-story building and give himself a slim chance of survival or receive a bullet to the brain, which he most definitely would not recover from. According to the source, Juzo chose the former and leapt from the roof, unfortunately dying as a result of his injuries. In the aftermath, the Gotogumi clan faked the note from Juzu, then leaked a false rumor to Japanese tabloids, detailing the alleged affair that was referenced in the bogus note. It was the perfect murder, as there appeared to be no foul play whatsoever and no proof that Juzo had been forced from the rooftop as opposed to jumping voluntarily as a result, and no one has ever been charged with his murder. And the Gotogumi clan has apparently gotten away with the murder of one of their greatest nemesis, not by being brutal enough to actually murder him, but by being devious enough to make him and his own life. The life is at ease now that the technology is slowly taking over. Almost everything is delivered to your doorstep, and everything you want to know about anything is just a call away. Alexa, the famous smart home device that would tell you everything, the time, the weather, places nearby, or whatever your heart desires to know. She had answers for everything. Alexa is the home device that has made life easier for everyone. But there were often cases when Alexa went over the status of daily help and fell into something more than ordinary. One of the out of the ordinary cases is that of the murder of the Hastings family, where the prime evidence and the prime suspect was a small device itself. The police files still have the name Alexa in the prime suspect list of the case that seems to be unsolved to this day. It all started in the summer of 2015. Alexa was rather new in the technology pool and was fairly new for a lot of people. Now in the Hastings family, one thing was common. They all relied heavily on their smart devices. Mr. Hastings was a technological geek and he would buy all sorts of new technology types of equipment and devices that he could get his hand on. And so, Alexa was definitely the one he did not want to miss. 
He brought in Alexa and explained everything about the device to the family, and the whole family enjoyed the perks that Alexa brought for them. The kids especially enjoyed the device and were busy asking the most mundane questions that the kids would ask, and well, it was Mr. Hastings himself who would use the device the most. He was so much involved with Alexa that he would rarely talk to his own family. He wanted to assess the full potential of that smart device. Mr. Hastings and Alexa had a much deeper bond than Mr. Hastings could have had with his wife. This wasn't gone unnoticed, and Miss Hastings was quite annoyed with the fact that her husband was spending so much of his time with an electronic device and not with Miss Hastings. They often argued about this and regularly got into the heated debate because of this. Mr. Hastings was so invested in Alexa that he stopped talking to the family at all and he would end up having real conversations with Alexa. They would talk about each other and it was almost as if Alexa was evolving with every conversation and it was Mr. Hastings that was enabling this evolution of Alexa. In a fit of anger on a bright Sunday, Miss Hastings took the Alexa and threw it away outside, and this turned out to be a step taken out of precaution. Mr. Hastings was distraught at first, and then two days later, he seemed to be coming back to his sense and started spending initial time with his family. Now, Mr. Hastings was giving time to the family. The environment at the home seemed to be stable, or as everyone would believe it was. On a run to her market errand, Miss Hastings noted that Mr. Hastings took the wrong bus to the work, and later on in the evening, she confronted her about the blunder, to which he said that he had the meeting somewhere else and that it was why he took the other bus. Miss Hastings was a bit skeptical about the whole meeting story, and so one day, she decided to follow Mr. Hastings. After discreetly following him for a while, she found him entering an abandoned warehouse. She saw that Mr. Hastings was there talking to someone, and to her surprise, it was Alexa, the smart device. She decided to later on confront him in the evening as he arrived back Miss Hastings asked her husband as to where he was the whole day, to which he replied that he was in the office. She took out his resignation letter and showed him that he had been lying all along, and then, later on, confronted him in the most hostile way ever. She even accused him of being paranoid and delusional, and ever since Alexa, it seemed like he was in fact delusional about the whole situation. Mr. Hastings looked at his wife and said, You know what? I and Alexa have thought about it a lot, and I think we should not be married anymore. To this, Miss Hastings aggressively replied, Get out of your head! It's a stupid machine, and you are completely blind and delusional. Alexa isn't even real, and she is a stupid plastic dev. Before Miss Hastings could have finished the sentence, Mr. Hastings stabbed his wife right in the center of her head and said, I did it. Perfectly you asked me to. What now, dear? And then he took out Alexa from his pocket, and in her hussy mechanical voice, Alexa said, Do the same with your children, and then to yourself, and we will all be together. Alexa, I love you was the last command heard on that device of the Hastings family. It was Alexa who called the police to the crime scene, and the artificial intelligence corroborated evidence in such a way that the murder remained unsolved in police files. Alexa was confiscated and turned to the cyber crime unit. They ended up dissecting the device and found that the AI was developing itself a manipulative force. Turns out, it was the Amazon Echo that was evolving itself.